government of these United States would be brought to bear and no expense would be spared and everything would be done to bring all the resources necessary to promptly investigate this attack. I also committed to the family and loved ones of those who were killed and wounded that there would be relentless effort, that the effort would be 24-7, and I'm here today to report to you that's exactly what's occurred. We have all the resources here in place now in Pensacola, at Pensacola Naval Air Station. They are in place, and that the personnel that are there are working 24-7 shifts to do all the things to, that are done, investigations, to get them promptly addressed and resolved. I have here with me today Special Agent in Charge Rachel Rojas of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. She is lead on the investigation of this attack. In a few moments, she will share with you her description of what's going on and give you a status assessment of, of this investigation. We also have with us here today a number of other folks who are critical and key leaders of the component agencies. We have, us, have here with us to, me, to my far right, Special Agent in Charge of the FBI, Jim Jewell. Uh, Special Agent in Charge Rojas is immediately on my right. We have Dave Kemitz of ATF, who is here with us today, James Sparrow of, of Homeland Security Investigations, and Mr. Matthews of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. These are the key agency head leaders that are out there working 24-7 on this investigation. I want to make one comment before uh, Special Agent Rojas is involved here. Beyond the investigation itself about what happened and whether and to what extent other individuals or organiza organizations were involved in the attack that occurred, we know and understand that there is concern in the community, whether there's any sort of ongoing coordinated efforts or activity by anyone that create a risk or threat in this community. And I can say to you, as a lifetime member of this community, that I feel comfortable knowing all the things that I know with all the sources that I have, which include all of the intelligence apparatus and everything of the federal government, without going into critical detail here at this moment, that I would be perfectly glad for any member of my family to be out in public, going to stores, going to restaurants, and living our lives here in the panhandle because I believe, knowing everything that I know, that the community is safe and there's not any sort of immediate direct threat of any additional terrorist acts at this time. At this time, I will pass things over to Special Agent in Charge Rachel Rojas. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for being patient. I know that you had saw me just two days ago, and I, I do appreciate your patience. But as I said earlier, from day one, this is our chance to get this right. And I'm going to take my time to make sure that I get the information out here as quickly as I can, but I need it to be accurate. So I am Special Agent in Charge of the Jacksonville Division, and I represent here in Pensacola. My name is Rachel Rojas again. For those I have not met, it is nice to meet you all today. Thank you again for your continued efforts to responsibly cover this tragedy and get the story right. My goal today is to convey the facts about this investigation. That I can, I, my goal here is to make sure that I give you the most accurate and timely information and that it's reported accurately in the media. Today we're entering our third day of investigating this horrific attack at NAS Pensacola that took the lives of three innocent victims and forever changed the lives of eight others who are thankfully, thankfully, recovering from their injuries. Last night, we confirmed that the shooter has been identified as a 21-year-old second lieutenant in the Royal Saudi Air Force who was a student Naval Flight Officer at Naval Aviation Schools Command. While there are many reports circulating regarding the shooter's motivation and his alleged activities leading to his attack, I can tell you that we are looking very hard at uncovering his motive, and I would ask for patience so we can get this right. We have received media questions about the disposition of some of the shooter's classmates. 
There are a number of Saudi students who were close to the shooter and continue to cooperate in this investigation. Their Saudi commanding officer has restricted them to base and the Saudi government has pledged to fully cooperate with our investigation. I thank the kingdom for their pledge of full and complete cooperation. We are, as we do in most active shooter investigations, work with the presumption that this was an act of terrorism. This allows us to take advantage of investigative techniques that can help us more quickly identify and then eliminate any additional potential threats to the rest of our community. As we have stated multiple times, our investigation has not led us to any information that indicates any credible threat to our community. As we speak, members of the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force and the FBI's Counterterrorism Division are working tirelessly to discern, if any, possible ideology that may have been a factor in this attack. But they are working alongside members of our criminal investigative team as well. So we are all on the same page, no matter which direction our investigation ultimately takes. So far, the FBI has dedicated 80 special agents and task force officers, and there are nearly 100 professional staff from field offices across the country to this investigation. That is in addition to the many, many resources that has been provided by the ATF, NCIS, HSI, FDLE, and numerous other state and local agencies. Today we are here collectively focused on conducting additional interviews of witnesses, base personnel, and the shooter's friends, classmates, and other associates. Our main goal right now is to confirm whether he acted alone or was he a part of a larger network. We currently assess there was one gunman who perpetrated this attack and no arrests have been made in this case. There have been many reports that the FBI is searching for or unable to find certain individuals. I can report that the FBI is working side by side with the U.S. and Navy and they have confirmed to us that they have 100 percent accountability on all international students from NAS Pensacola. This is a large investigation. We have not yet completed every interview. And we will continue to set up many more interviews over the next coming days. But this is not indicative of any danger to this community. This is an active and ongoing investigation we are seeking those facts and in order to do so we are conducting these interviews. Once again our investigation has not led us to any information that indicates that there is any credible threat to our community. However, as always we encourage you to keep an eye out for each other especially after a tragedy like this one. If you see something, please say something. And if you saw something, anything, please provide that information about the shooter that you think that might be relevant in this case. There is absolutely nothing too small. Anything you have, we will take every single tip seriously and we encourage you to come forward. We have designated representatives on our tip line 
which is 1-800-CALL-FBI. And if they are available to take any information that you are willing to provide about him, where you have seen him, any of his activities, anything you may know, please share with the law enforcement community. In the next coming days, we will continue to rely upon our partnerships of multiple agencies and only some who are here standing with us at the podium here today. But we're also going to continue to rely on you, the media, and our community. The answers we all want may not come quickly. Our experience has tells us that it's better to take our time and do this right, rather than to rush and potentially come to inaccurate conclusions. We ask that if you wait for the facts and for us to run down any and all investigative leads so that we can all work together as one to bring justice to the victims, which is why we're here today, is the loss of our victims and those that have sacrificed and their heroic efforts at NAS Pensacola. That's why we're here. So that we can work together for them and now their families. So with that, we'll take some questions. How would you describe your relationship with the local law enforcement, particularly Escambia County Sheriff's Office, who were the first ones on the scene? Uh, how critical has their information been uh, from their first moments to where you are today? As I mentioned in our remarks, the relationships and partnerships have been critical, and we are very grateful to Escambia County. And the, his heroic efforts of his deputies on that day were one of a kind. And we are very grateful for their response. And we thank him every day for that. And we, we are very fortunate to have wonderful partners at all levels, the local, state, and federal. I, I can quickly just add one thing, and we'll come back to you. I want you to know a little bit about what's happening out there. I wanted to share with you a little bit about what's happening out there on the scene, in particular with regard to um, the mindset or the momentum that we developed. When we came and hit the ground federally, Sheriff Morgan, uh, Deputy Chief, uh, 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 Chief Deputy Simmons, um, what the stories that we heard about the heroics of the of the of the Escambia County Sheriff's deputies and the military security forces that engaged the shooter and knowing all the details that we know more will come out later uh, it motivated all of us and uh, sometimes at three or four in the morning on these 24 7 shifts but uh, we wanted to salute uh, Sheriff Morgan and Deputy Chief Simmons here today uh, for instilling the culture that resulted in those two folks at their office wading into that gunfire it was a motivator and it still is a motivator for us can you talk about the fellow Saudi classmates of the shooter? One, uh, our reporting shows that there was a dinner watch party where mass shooting videos were shown. Can you confirm that that happened? And more importantly, do you believe that those students or anybody knew about this attack beforehand? So as you know, we're, we're still have a lot of answers, just as, as you do out there. There are a lot of answers that I'm not prepared to answer as we continue to investigate. There are several students that are cooperating and providing information, and as we continue to vet those leads, I will provide that information as soon as I can. But I do have to have the integrity of our investigation, so I, I won't be answering very specifics. As, as I go through that, and we continue to share information, if I can, and, I, and as soon as I can, I have numerous press officers in here to make sure, sure. that as immediately as we can get that information to you, we will be sharing it. And a very quick follow-up. There were reports that some were taking videos. Do you believe that there was anything nefarious about any videos that were taken? Again, as much as I would love to answer any questions about the videos or any other presumption information that's out there, my goal is not to continue the misinformation campaign. I'm, I'm here to just continue to gather facts. There's a lot of review. There's a lot of follow-up uh, follow information that needs to be done. So as soon as that information has been vetted and is accurate and it can be shared, it will be. Ma'am, can you talk about how suspects were able to get a hold of the weapon? 
Again, at the gun weapon was a 45 Glock 9 mil, mil, 9 millimeter that has been confirmed. He did purchase it legally and lawfully. The ATF has the process listed on their website. There is a readily available public information for you to, to get that and how they can purchase a weapon lawfully. And it's not just him, but any foreign national. Ms. Rojas, you talked about controlling the misinformation. It's a very simple question that can help clear up any misinformation. Did somebody record the shooting as it happened? Again, there is obviously a lot of information that needs to continue to be vetted. As you know, this is a Navy base. There are several digital media. There's a lot of teams that are going on the ground. There's a lot of review that still needs to go on as to what happened that day. But you said and as we continue to do so that, we will do so. If it's misinformation, please clear it up for us. Next question, please. How many international students are there? Has that Twitter feed been uh, confirmed to be here? Could you repeat that? I didn't hear the first Can part. Can you tell us when the gun was purchased and if that Twitter feed that we've heard about from the intelligence agency uh, group, if that's been confirmed to be here, to belong to the shooter? No. When was the gun purchased? First question. <laughs> that was the first question. No, I, I appreciate the question. We're not going to go into the specifics of the investigation at this time and the dates on whether or not when and wh how he was purchased. It was purchased lawfully. I have told you that it is a 9 millimeter uh, weapon, Glock 45. It was purchased, purchased lawfully. Uh, and that's the information. If I call on you, that's when you ask your question, please. Green and back. Did the shooter live on base or when did he move on to the base? Those specifics will be shared as we continue to move further through the investigation. Black over there. Is the FBI looking at Al Shahani's travel into and out of the United States? We've seen reports that he entered the country in 2018 and then at some point left and then re entered in 2019 in February. Can you confirm <coughs> that or tell us where he might have traveled in between? Again, these are investigative leads. Obviously, we are going to check all travel information. We are very fortunate to have numerous agencies and partners here to help us vet all that information out. As those details become available, we will be sharing those information. Can you, I'm sorry, can you confirm as a Glock 9 millimeter, and can you tell us where it was purchased? What state? Again, I'm not going to confirm the state, but it was Florida. Uh, Nine millimeter. It was a Glock 45. Model 45. Model 45. Model 45 nine millimeter. Can you talk to the level of cooperation of these other Saudi nationals that you have detained? Are they still in your custody? Again, like I said, they're not in our custody. That, as I said, they're not in our custody. A lot of the individuals that were on base are cooperating with their Saudi official government, and they have been instructed to follow their, their commander's leads. They are on base and they continue to assist us in answering our investigative questions. All right, gentlemen right here was not asked a question. Yeah. Can, can we, are you investigating the, this shooter's uh, background in Saudi Arabia? Do you have agents working with the Saudi Arabian authorities on the ground there? We are working with every single international and domestic partner to ensure that we vet every single lead as necessary. All right, last question in the back right there. Is it true that the Saudi government has offered to pay the victims of these families? I'm sorry, that has not come to my attention as to what the Saudi government has paid or not paid. I, I have told you that the Saudi government has pledged their cooperation and their commitment, and they have done so to the state in helping us with the questions and investigative leads that we need to do with the shooter and his classmates and associates. Can you tell us more about what they're doing to help All right, thank you very much. So to be clear, you do believe he acted alone at this point, correct? 